Welcome to this new season of the lecture series of the Network for Ocean Worlds. This network has been formed by NASA to advance comparative studies to characterize the Earth and other ocean worlds across their interiors, oceans, and cryospheres. In particular, the studies investigate their habitability, the search for biosignatures, and try to understand life in such environments. In this new season, we will see with four episodes how we can explore ocean worlds through analogues. This first episode focuses on field studies that are presented by two speakers, first by Alexis Templeton from the University of Colorado, and then by Craig Lee from APL and the University of Washington. Alexis is a geochemist and microbiologist who is seeking signatures of life activity in sulfur springs and ices in the Canadian High Arctic with the objective to inform life detection strategies on ocean worlds. Craig is a physical oceanographer who is developing long endurance autonomous exploration of ice covered seas. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with now today. Um, my intention is to talk a little bit about a site we've been using in the Canadian High Arctic at Fort Fjord Pass to discuss why we've chosen it as a analog site for ocean world studies and how our concept of why it's a useful site field analog for ocean world systems um, has evolved through time and the ways we're thinking that it could be useful in the future for the community. Great, okay. Did, did the slide advance? I just wanna make sure, all right. So the work I'm gonna talk about today is been conducted through a really wonderful team that I've been able to work with for several years now. Um, all of our work at Fort Fjord Pass has been enabled by Steve Brasby, who's in the Canadian Geologic Survey and is really an expert on the site at Fort Fjord Pass. And John Spear at the Colorado School of Mines and I have teamed up for a long time in co-advising various students and postdocs that I'll speak about some of their work today who have used the site for their PhD theses. And then we've had the pleasure of getting to work with Bob Papalardo on and off over time. And part of that has to do with Bob's history that he was actually a professor here at the University of Colorado in the early 2000s. And when both John and I were starting as assistant professors and I was on thesis committees with some of his students, and he then moved to JPL and his roles there changed through time, but he's remained um, connected into various parts of the work that we've done at Bora. So what I'm gonna talk about today is this intriguing site that we've been working at where on an annual basis, there's the formation of elemental sulfur deposits as well as sulfate salts, carbonate minerals, and other phases that form on the surface of the ice at the toe of a glacial system. And as I was saying, I wanna sort of come into the questions of why do we think of this as being a potential analog environment for studying processes that are relevant on ocean worlds. So when we look at BORUP, we're interested in both physiochemical processes, but microbiological processes, and other aspects of the so organic chemistry of these environments, and how we would detect evidence of life activity or biosignatures that are produced and preserved in these kinds of environments. Now, in the early days of this work, we were the reason that this site stood out so much was that at that point in time, very little was known about the surface of Europa and what it was its potential chemical constituents. And the interest was in whether or not any of the minerals and materials that were present on the surface of Europa did or did not reflect some aspect of the composition of an underlying ocean. And again, back in uh, sort of mid 2000s, the, even the idea of exactly how thick the ice shell was and, and um, the potential dynamics of the ocean were being in early sort of stages of exploration. Using these types of um, NASA cartoons for imagining an ocean world like a Europa system, we just come back to the idea of if there is a, a rocky core to a planet like or a moon like this with hydrothermal activity that's in many ways um, shaping parts of the chemistry of that ocean, and there's the communication or delivery of materials from the surface through ice overturn, and for example, delivering oxidants and giving rise to a habitable environment. What's the potential then for the delivery of any kind of biological molecules and materials to the surface of Europa and our ability to detect them and recognize them as signs of life? So 
um, at this point in time, what's very intriguing is knowing, of course, that we have the Europa Clipper mission that will be able to at least do a significant amount of remote sensing on Europa's surface and start to help to provide information to infer more about the dynamics of what's happening in terms of ocean surface exchange and to help identify if there were sampling targets on the surface of Europa of what kinds of materials you might collect and what exactly you'd be trying to detect. So, in some of what I'll talk about today was is placed in the context of field work that was ongoing through the conceptual development of something like a land admission to the surface of Europa to develop the instruments and develop the, the approaches to try and do light detection. So, in Borfjord Pass, in terms of it being a potential analog for looking at this type of chemistry on Europa's surface, the idea here is that someone definitely has some back chatter, I think, from on their audio, um, is the idea that there is, we're sitting at 81 North, on north of Ellesmere Island. There's a glacial system here, and where the coalescence of two different glaciers that are present, um, we can often detect from satellite or, or airplane or helicopter level remote sensing, the formation of mineral deposits on the ice surface, typically in the times of May, June, and into July. And Bob Papalardo and his graduate student Dobnik Gleason were interested in using this as a site for remote sensing at first, trying to verify some of the spectral signatures of non ice surface constituents that were being in, uh, assessed on the surface of Europe at the time. So there was a lot of data that was being um, analyzed to infer that there was things like sulfuric acid, um, hydrated sulfate mineral salts, and other phases present on the surface of Europa. We didn't have good spectral analogs for trying to compare against those materials, but sitting here at, at Borfjord Pass was the formation of sulfur phases on ice, which is the only place on Earth that had any kind of similar chemistry or mineralogy. So Dobnik's thesis, in terms of initially establishing this site as a potential Europa analog environment, was to do remote sensing in a variety of spatial scales, and um, to confirm then what was the composition of materials that were forming on the surface of the ice in the system. So uh, I have one of the references here from Gleason's work, but in conceptual idea was that at first she was working at collecting these data of basically sulfur, sulfate minerals, carbonate minerals on, on ice and, and using those for comparison to these other studies. And at this point in time, um, as she came to work with me and I got really excited because I don't do remote sensing spectroscopy, but the in system was intriguing because elemental sulfur shouldn't be stable on the surface of ice on the on Earth's surface, at least today. We have oxygen in our atmosphere. This is a metastable or unstable mineral. It should react with that oxygen and convert into sulfate salts. So there were, must be processes going on that are dynamically occurring that are both producing elemental sulfur and preserving it. And so the question we had in our mind was, is the sulfur itself a biomineral or produced and produced in different ways through biological activity that we'd be able to recognize both during the process and after these deposits were made? And coupled to that was an interest in the geochemistry and the microbiology to try and understand how the sort of extreme icy ecosystem would function and how sulfur cycling dynamics occur. So this essentially transitioned our next phase of work into being a geomicrobiology study or life in extreme environments. Um, so one of the students who was leading a lot of the work at this point in time, her name was Catherine Wright, um, was able to piggyback up to this site in the high Arctic with um, to be able to look at the spring source. And the spring source is essentially where all the sulfur minerals are coming from. So it turns out that every spring there is a sulfitic spring. It's a salty water with a lot of dissolved hydrogen sulfide in it that punches through at the terminus of the glacier at slightly different points every time. And as it gushes forth, we start to see the production of elemental sulfur, which has been built up into these deposits you can see from space. So Catherine was hunting for the spring source, and then the goal was to characterize what is the chemistry of this fluid that's coming up from the subsurface, and then to look at the biological dynamics. So again, it's, it's a cold fluid, um, it's sitting there in neutral pH, it's got a lot of dissolved sulfide as well as other sulfur uh, components that are present within it. And in this case, she's using voltammetry in situ to try and measure the redox reactions that are occurring as this fluid that's been trapped in the subsurface comes into Earth's atmosphere, it's far from equilibrium, and all sorts of reactions start to ensue. 
Um, she also was then studying some of the sulfur deposits as they were forming. So these wet, gloopy materials building up um, in the system as the spring discharge continues, and they were a target for trying to extract things like DNA and to measure the solid phase geochemistry and any fluids that you could get out of them. And when you have this kind of data or system, what you can do is try to frame the habitability of that environment. So you're trying to look at what are the possible redox reactions that should support microbial metabolism. And she could look at a whole suite of these that involve the oxidation of reduced sulfur compounds or organics or nitrogen species that we could measure in the fluid. And in her work show that sulfur oxidation processes were orders of magnitude more important than other reactions in terms of the energy available to support life. And so her work pivoted then towards doing the, the metagenomes, trying to understand the biology of the organisms that were living in that system and their genetic potential to actually mediate these reactions. Not a path I'm going to go down today in this talk. Um, one thing, though, I do just want to say quickly about the biology and what you can do by sequencing or filtering the biomass in the fluids and then comparing that to something like in the sulfur deposits, you always get a clear distinction. There's a different community of who's living on the subsurface than who's on the surface deposits. And that's because all this elemental sulfur and other minerals are forming through a bloom of biological activity. It's like a kickstart to the system when you put all this reduced sulfur into the surface environment and allow all of these oxidation reactions to run rampant, biologically mediated, and new organisms, sulfur oxidizing or organisms take over. In terms of starting to um, look at what all is exactly contained within these sulfur deposits, a variety of techniques can be applied. For example, Raman microspectroscopy, uh, that's been very useful to not only verify in field or, or at home that you have dominated by elemental sulfur, but you can also then look at the formation of the sulfate salts or carbonate minerals. You can use FTIR and be able to detect organic functional groups that are present and preserved within the sulfur deposits. And in some of the work that Graham Lau, who was a PhD student at this point in time, now working on the project, did a very interesting study at the actual forms of the crystalline sulfur that were being produced in the system. And although alpha sulfur was the predicted, thermodynamically predicted form, there was many metastable phases of beta and a gamma sulfur that were being produced and preserved. And that was a flag. It was a flag that something's happening here again that's holding and stabilizing elemental sulfur under a condition that it shouldn't be preserved. And there was a lot of interest in the role of organics in nucleating and stabilizing sulfur, and then interest in the role of microorganisms and potentially have been the source of those organics. And some of the work that Graham did, he was also able to come and collect these sulfur deposits and search for them um, using x-ray microscopy techniques to detect where organic carbon resides within them and its role in the growth of the elemental sulfur deposits and the types of functional groups and, and moieties that were important in that behavior. So as I've been just marching forward through these few years of field work and going field to lab, where we were moving towards at this point in time was a conceptual model in our head where at Borup Fjord Pass, there's these high um, uh, rocky mountains on either side of the system. They're ice covered. You think that there's a hydrologic system that allows the pumping down of, of water into the subsurface environment, and that water then gets stored in sulfate-rich rocks, and there's also organic shales down there. So that creates an environment, as I'm putting the circle down here, of a subsurface environment, which is habitable. It's habitable because there's the energy available for metabolism like sulfate reduction. That's the conversion of sulfate to sulfide. It's being driven by the presence of organic matter that's down there. And organisms can make a living doing that and the product of all of their activity and their metabolism is H2S gas. So this is the source term for the sulfitic spring. It's where water's being stored. It's where water's getting sulfitic. And a lot of the times it's locked into this subsurface, but in the spring when there's a change in the hydrology and the thawing begins, you can get a punch up of those fluids to the surface environment. And so there's a variety of different paths through which fluid can transfer through the ice system. And then we have the expression of a sulfide spring where we get these blooms of microbial activity, blooms where organisms take off and start producing elemental sulfur deposits and sulfates through a wholly different form of metabolism, the sulfur oxidation process. 
And that's what we as field explorers are seeing at the surface, the expression of that secondary activity, the bloom activity. And it, at this point in time, then our interest was coming to return to really understand again a lot of the dynamics of the microbial ecosystem. That was our intention in returning to BORP and what John Spear and um, Steve Grasby and I had proposed to do in our next work. In the end, we actually had to pivot quite uh, quite a bit and in very interesting ways. And that's where the other part of this talk is going to go. Um, so here we are at BORP, our, our Ocean World Analog site, and we returned to do field work where we wanted to study the formation of elemental sulfur from these active spraying systems. And this is what it looks like from a helicopter view when we first started this particular field season. We have ice over here on the left, then you see something called the blister, and then it's kind of yellowy green going to the right of your screen, and then we go downstream. And this is an icing that is uh, and when we look at this, we can see that there's elemental sulfur. So we're really excited. We know that we've arrived for a field season. We've got sulfur production going on. We want to look at the dynamics. However, as we hunted day in and day out, and particularly around the blister, but all through this different area in the region, we could not find any active sulfide springs. And so, we, well, there's a lot of sulfur that's formed. Have we missed all the action as the spring happened? And this is just all a deposit that is formed from that activity, and we can just study the remnants of, of this season. And so we're looking around and we're tracking it. As you can see here, there's the blister in the middle. Then we have the sulfur and it's going downstream. And hopefully you can see that sort of yellow as you're heading downstream too, in comparison to the glacial ice that's in the forefront of this image. Sulfur Falls, just a beautiful image of another area where we're down and we're exploring. We're seeing all this elemental sulfur that's present, but we can't find the source term in terms of the spring. But what we do start to notice is that a lot of areas that are white become yellow. So day in and day out as we're hiking, we're exploring, we're trying to find a spring, we're smelling sulfide, we're trying to sniff out and detect the point source. We're seeing the formation of sulfur without any of the fluid dynamics that we were expecting. So what we started to do was to take silver foils. Silver will react with sulfide and makes a black precipitate. And we started putting it into the ice in different places, particularly where melting was occurring and where we started to see the formation of things like this with bubbles and sulfur materials starting to form. And there was a quick reaction that happened. So it, what the idea is, is that there's hydrogen sulfide actually stored in the ice itself, and it's dissolving out and it's reacting with the foil. And then um, John was also working on bubble stripping the different fluids, and we can measure hydrogen, methane, and other dissolved gases. So this was very exciting, but puzzling in terms of just our mental conception of what was occurring in the system at the time. We started collecting these bubbles of sulfur that would form on the top of melt pools. So as we could see them nucleate and grow, then we would collect them and preserve them. You can also look at them under a microscope and you'll have lots of mat particulate material of sulfur, but there's small cells that are swimming by. There's all sorts of cell-like structures, filaments, sheaths, and organ or mineralized materials with sulfur. And in the background of this picture here, what you should see is yellow of a veneer. It's it's, it's stuck onto the ice surface, but it's sulfur that's forming and it's now just it's part of the ice itself as a, as a surface product. So in stepping back as we work through this area regionally, what we came to realize is that we really had two different types of ice that were present. There's the glacier region here with freshwater ices and then the blister is in the middle of this picture and then it's called the alf ice region. And flowing downstream and away from this terminus of the glacier, it's a set of ices that are turning yellow from sulfurization, but the upper ices are not. So we converted our study to not be looking at the dynamics in an active spring system, but rather to study the ice dynamics and the changes in ice chemistry. So from the blister and moving downstream, we started to set up a series of different sites. And from those, we could do comparative chemistry and microbiology, trying to understand what made these different ices di um, distinguishable from each other. And um, in this particular case, we, uh, the whole ALF ice system, which is called a spring formed ice, became the focus area for us. So we were tracking the hypothesis that a lot of the downstream ice was not just discharged from the glacial system, but actually was discharged from a spring. And it wasn't a fluid flow, it was an ice flow that was present. Way we were able to confirm that is by collecting samples and melting them and measuring the chemistry of the ices as we went downstream. And there essentially is a large just, um, distinguishing chemical features between 
these alpha ice samples and the glacial ice samples, where the alpha ice samples are um, salty, they've got a lot of chloride and sulfate. Later, when we measure them, they also have hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, hydrogen, methane, other dissolved gases in them. And so we could take those and also filter them and look at the microbiology of who's living in these ices of different varying chemistry across this gradient that's present. Um, Chris Trivedi, who's doing his PhD thesis on this work too, has published a set of papers where he's looked at then the microbial community as it varies across these chemical gradients, um, looked at the metabolic pathways they're using and the different ways that sulfur is being um, oxidized through a variety of different partners in the system. Again, I'm not going to end up getting into the microbiology in this particular talk, but I refer you back to those as, as sort of how we now understand what's going on biologically here. But the conceptual part that I think is important for ocean worlds exploration is this. Um, when we're here at Bora, the thing that's changed a little bit is we still have these mountains. We have recharge of glacial water, and we have storage of water in the subsurface where there's this biological sulfate reduction going on. And that fluid is stored there, and then it is delivered again in the spring to the surface environment. But it turns out that through tracking this through time now, it's only a small period of time where there's active flow going on that you can get to the site and observe. But there's a whole period of time, a lot of it early in the season, while it's even still dark there, where fluids are discharging and they're quenching and freezing in place. That's how the alpha ice is forming. It's burping out of the subsurface, it's flowing downstream, it's freezing and getting locked into place. And that's preserving an ice that contains all this information about the subsurface biosphere, about the chemistry, the biology, and the organics that are there. And this is exciting because we need to be able to think through the ways we would sample on the surface of an icy moon. We have a landed mission. The question will be, where do we find the freshest materials, those that have had the least amount of radiation processing, and have the best potential of having had direct communication to the subsurface ocean? And we can look at it being delivered through plumes, but also different ways that there's communication and locking into place that subsurface fluid being frozen into an ice and being sampleable and used for life detection. So in this particular case, when we went started to go back in time, we were realizing that we're standing on top of an ice that underneath us is living with the organisms from the subsurface biosphere within them. And, the, and again, all those faults and other materials. And we're getting distracted often by this veneer, the yellow on the surface, but that's not our real target because the yellow on the surface is formed through processes that are all not representative of that deeper biosphere. They're the reaction with oxygen in our atmosphere from sunlight and at high energetic particles and things like that. We wanna get below the sulfur and get into the fresh ices underneath there that contain those dissolved gases and, and again, biota. So, um, the last few slides are just pivoting then into thinking about this and how useful this is for as we start thinking about the testing of protocols, instrument designs, and others for ocean worlds exploration. And when we were there on the site, we had a few types of instrumentation available to us. We're trying to make in-situ measurements that we move from using in a spring to looking at the melting process of the ice and looking at the flux of what was being released from it as that happened. Um, but in, you know, on the right here, I have you know, examples of some of the baseline instrument choices that might be made um, in terms of microscopy, vibrational spectroscopy, and the ability to characterize organics in a landed mission on an ocean world. And here I also just list a handful of the, of the instruments that we're often discussing that have been supported through programs like IC2 that would have some of the capabilities to be able to test themselves against making measurements on ices and water from melt pools like this. I've been particularly excited about this project, the Ocean Worlds Life Surveyor. It's led by Peter Willis and Chris Linden Smith. And in this particular case, as like with, with many of these designs now, that conceptual approach is to be able to visualize life, to be able to detect if there are cells, cell-like structures and materials, and the motility of organisms that actually might be locked into ice, but could be able to move again once this is melted. And using in that particular case things like holographic microscopy and fluorescence microscopy to the ability to detect things like amino acids and more complex organic molecules 
as well as the salts and the matrix that they're contained in, in this particular case, using things like capillary electrophoresis coupled to a variety of different detection methods, depending on the nature of the molecules that you're trying to determine. And the last sort of main point to make too is that four ice samples, I think, are, are very interesting challenge for life detection approaches. And the reason I say that is that when we consider ocean world exploration, we're expecting the energy available to be small, and that's going to translate into low cell densities. In this type of environment, we're often only looking at 10 to the 2 cells per gram or um, per mil. It depends on like, which part of the system you're looking at, up to 10 to the 5. And so these can be hard detection thresholds. Low levels of total organic carbon, but it's there. And again, it agglomerates and accumulates in certain materials you learn to recognize. The ice matrix is salty. And it also has this dissolved sulfide, and that is an instrument challenge that um, I haven't heard discussed a lot, but sulfide can wreak havoc with a lot of aspects of measurement, but it's very much expected in an ocean world environment. Um, and a, par a part of the story that I don't have time to tell today, but also that at BORP we have evidence for the production of, of false biosignatures, and which will also be an interesting challenge of our ability to discriminate in those aspects of life and non-life. And lastly, you can bring the stuff home and you can do the in situ analysis and in situ science, but it is entirely possible to bring home excellent samples of these ice materials, alpha ice that gets preserved to be able to use against laboratory instruments and for validation. So, in terms of the story I was trying to tell is that we worked, it was initially established at Bora Fjord Pass as an ocean world analog site on the basis of remote sensing is needed for verification of spectroscopic signatures of non-ice materials on Europa. It's been an exciting place to study life in extreme environments. Um, I didn't get into the studies of what we do and don't know from DNA, RNA, and cultivation-based approaches. What I think is important for the future is this idea of these alpha ices, because we have very few places where we can look at ices that might capture subsurface biosphere information. Um, and they have good preservation of cells and tax cells, as well as organic molecules. Um, and materials produced through biological activity. But we need to be able to learn to differentiate between the surface processing of the ices and the, uh, the, what, the, what the subsurface chemistry really is and how you differentiate between those two. Um, and so the proposal and the suggestion here today is that microorganisms and organics could be, um, that are present in these can be very good for ground truthing like det detection measurements. Um, and in particular, there's a lot of complexity in the organic carbon here and what it does and does not represent. Um, and uh, so many evolving approaches right now to look at molecular complexity that can again be tested against this kind of a system. So with that, I say thank you and I'll take any questions with it, if we have any time left. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Nikki. So maybe, Mike, can you under the questions? Yes, um, so we do have a few questions from the uh, Mentimeter here. Uh, let's see, uh, one of them is how common or rare are these sulfur deposits on Earth? Um, they're rare on ice. So you definitely can get sulfide spring discharge in processes of microbial sulfur oxidation and sulfide in deep sea hydrothermal environments to terrestrial environments. So that chemical process and the biology associated with it is pretty prevalent. But this is the one of the rare places where it happens in an ice context. Okay, and I'm going to combine two of them up. Is have we already detected sulfur on the ocean worlds? And with respect to the different ocean worlds, Jupiter system, Saturn system, and then Uranus and Neptune system, where would you expect to see the most sulfur? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if we stick with Europa for a moment, just because we use that as the dominant analog today. Yeah, there's sulfur, for example, deposition from things like Io, uh, volcanism on Io, so that's putting sulfur on the surface. And it's been, again, um, expected that at least some of the materials on the surface of Europa could be hydrated sulfate salts. And this has always been of great interest because if there's hydrated sulfur on the surface and there's some ice overturn, that's delivering that as a very important oxidant that gives rise to habitability in an ocean world like that. So the sulfur dynamics have long been in just sort of modeled as being likely and important. Um, in terms of our, how well have we done this across many ocean worlds? I don't know. Um, that's a great question in terms of, I'd have to go back and look at some of the data on 
Enceladus and others might speak up to that if there's a chat that's going at the moment, but almost any of these systems, I'd expect sulfur as a chemically abundant component and it to be in its oxidized state on the surface of any of these bodies. The question of what form it is on the interior um, most likely should be reduced from what we understand the chemical dynamics, but we don't know. And then one last question is maybe is, so how long would the yellow stain that you're observing as the surface expression of the sulfur, how long would that last before it effectively went away from equilibrium processes, making it basically disappear? Yeah, great question. Um, we've, we've tried to look at that a little bit because there's paleo preserved deposits from prior spring activity. Um, and then there's what we've been looking at in the sort of active system. The active system part of the problem is the melt out. So we're, we're literally losing a lot of the, these materials because the, the ice itself through the season melts away and discharges. And it does leave behind residues though of the sulfur materials and the sulfate salts. And um, you can model the kinetics of how long should that sulfur last it's lasting longer than you might predict because, again, it seems to be stabilized through its nucleation and growth on the, on, in these organic carbon matrices. And that we don't have nearly as good data for, but it's an important part of stabilizing and preserving the, these signatures slash biosignatures that are there and are part of it. So there's, it's very, there's a lot of interest in how, how long that would persist, and I don't have a good answer to that, but I think it's a very interesting question. Awesome, cool. So, um, there is a mentee up, so if anybody has any other um, questions for Alexis, use code 59806376, and please like flag your question for Alexis, and we'll try to maybe get to that at the very end of the presentations. And I'll turn it over to Audrey to introduce the next speaker. Well, maybe I have a last question for Alexis. Oh, uh, okay. Do you see differences in the evolution of the organics? Well, the uh, by you think between summer and winter? Yeah, that's a good question. We haven't tracked that well. So in terms of what we, I, mean, I think we now understand the system dynamics better when it gets down to the, the, the some of the details of, again, mineral nucleation growth, the, orga, the, the complexity and the source of the organics and how they transform, tons of open room for study. Um, and so, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a good answer to that, but I'm very intrigued. Thank you very much. Uh, so we we'll jump to the second uh, part of this seminar. Uh, so quickly, we'll uh, talk about how is developing long endurance autonomous exploration of uh, ice covered seas. So Craig, can you share your screen? Thanks. Well, um, we'll change gears a little bit, I guess. And what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about work that, uh, that a, a large group of us actually has, have been pursuing, uh, figuring out how to deliver sensors in ice-covered environments. So I'm a, a physical oceanographer, I do ocean physics. Um, Jason Gobat is the lead technologist on our team, Luke Granville is another ocean physicist. Lee Freitag is a technologist at UI. That's kind of the core team. There are many others that have contributed to this and we'll see the names as we go through the, uh, through the talk. This is a work that's been sponsored by the Office of Naval Research, the National Science Foundation, and by the Paul Allen Family Foundation, who funded the work in the uh, an ice shelf experiment that I'll show you towards the end of the talk. So, um, really, what's what's underlying all this has been a revolution in how we do ocean observations in in the global ocean, and we've gone in a relatively short period of time. 20, 30 years from running around in ships, dipping instruments from the ship and doing experiments that way to increasingly doing them with, with robots. Um, at the start with things you moored to the, the bottom of the ocean, but uh, increasingly with mobile systems that can either navigate on their own or drift with the ocean currents or drift with the ice and make measurements. Uh, you see examples of those for ice covered environments here, things that sit on the ice, things that that, um, that sample in the water column and satellites, of course, right, which are a, a key both for, for navigation and communications, but also for large scale sensing. And really for the ocean, what we've been after is, is persistence, 
sustainability, the ability to do this for a long period of time, hit the climate scales, the ability to scale so we can observe very broadly in distributed fashion, and the ability to adapt to build systems that can change fairly rapidly as our needs change. Uh, as a physical oceanographer, I tend to think about these things in scales, where you know we think about the climate scale measurements we've been after, where we want to be out there for decades, measuring over large, large areas, to uh, to the kinds of data that we use to inform models, to initialize, constrain, assimilating models, and to situational awareness, where if you think about the Navy's needs, right, they want to know what's happening now, or a local community wants to know what's happening now. Can I go out to hunt? on the ice today. And we can break those needs down into, into issues of policy, strategy, and tactics, where policy are the, are the broad questions and tactics are the day-to-day the -day questions and everything in between. The tricky part for the physics is that the, they're nonlinear. We think about the fluid dynamics that govern, govern the oceans and the atmosphere, and therefore all the scales are connected, right? There are scale interactions that, that matter. And so typically you need to resolve a range of scales to, to really understand what's happening or to be able to build predictive models. The real game changer for oceanography, both for physical oceanography and for biogeochemistry in more recent years, has been the Argo Profile and Float Network. Um, what you see in the, the, the ocean covered with dots here is a network of 4,000 floats, or nearly 4,000 floats that are in the global ocean today. They're delivering profiles once every 10 days for each float roughly 300 kilometers spaced in the non-ice covered oceans. So the global is in quotes for Argo. But this has been a, this has been sustained for many years now and has changed the way we think about looking at the global oceans. Uh, the floats are little buoyancy driven instruments, right? They, they change their buoyancy, um, change their volume for constant mass, so either sink or rise in the water column. And because they can do that, they profile over the upper 2000 meters of the, the water. They drift in the 10 days in between the time that they profile, and they rely on satellites, iridium and GPS, to geolocate and to communicate when they're at the surface. Um, but really, that that that's been a been a revolutionary change in how we do do business and ocean observing. Gliders are another aspect of that change. Uh, they're essentially floats with wings, if you will. They're the vehicle that that my team develops. So I'm, I'll talk a little bit more about these. But again, they're, they're variable volume constant mass vehicles. So they change their change their density. When they get denser in seawater, they sink, and then they can change again and, and get lighter and rise. And then they can control where they go by changing their, their attitude, changing their center of gravity and, and changing the role. And by doing that, they can essentially translate that vertical, vertical motion generated by the lift of the wings and the body into into the horizontals. They can steer from place to place very, very slowly. Again, these are small vehicles, 50 kilos, two meters in length. Um, they profile over the upper, typically a upper thousand meters, although we have other variants. They're very slow, about 20 kilometers a day. That's how they go for long periods of time. And they can go for periods of exceeding a year of sampling at those speeds. So you can go quite a long way in, in a year, even if you're going slowly, many thousands of kilometers. Uh, we've been using them in ice covered environments for about 10 years, a bit over 10 years, really. Again, vehicles that rely on iridium and GPS at the surface, right? So you see this reliance on satellite services. Uh, sea Glider, the one that we develop, is one of a, a family of vehicles. Um, the current vehicle is SGX, 70 kilos, a little more capable. We have a 6,000 meter variant and we're developing a 3,000 meter variant in between that will be the bread and butter vehicle. There are other gliders out there right now that are commercially available and doing good science in the global oceans. They carry a range of payloads, right? You see this long list here, but at the end of the day, they carry a share of similarity in that it's sort of anything you can measure with electricity, light, or sound, and anything that can be done in a fairly small energy efficient package. Right at 70 kilos, you can imagine running on lithium primary batteries. Um, there's a limited number of things that you can do. All right, so so relatively payload limited. Um, if you think about what might um, what might come to pass in the future, as, as battery developments grow, we might 
people who carry better payloads. Sensor developments might allow greater range of measurements. The kinds of vehicles I've heard talked about for IC roles explorations involve uh, different power sources, right? Thermonuclear generators, things like that, that might enable a, a greater range of sensors as well. Um, Alex has talked about this a bit, but in the ocean, we think about leveraging sensor networks where ships are floating laboratories, right? Anything we can do on land, we can, most things we can do on a ship. So you can do a broad range of measurements. And the question has always been, how do you leverage those measurements out onto the kinds of measurements you can make with sensors on floats and gliders and smaller platforms? That's fundamentally done by building proxies, right? How do we, how do we interpret fluorescence to, uh, to understand how much chlorophyll pigment there is in the water or how much cedon pigment there is in the water. That's one of the simple proxies, but there are others, right? We can combine some of these more limited measurements to make inferences about what sorts of, um, what sorts of community composition we have in plankton, phytoplankton and zooplankton. And then stability and cross calibration of sensors has been a, a, a big part of, part of the effort for these networks. The sensors that we have are not terribly stable at the moment as you get out to the more ambitious measurements for plankton, zooplankton, uh, geochemical properties. So uh, how do you keep them calibration and how do you cross calibrate across an entire network of sensors so that you know when you're measuring something from a dozen different platforms that you can intercompare them? There are more sophisticated autonomous vehicles, auto sub long range developed at Bass and National Oceanography Center, Southampton. Is, is probably one of the premier vehicles in that category and is, to my knowledge, um, well, up to recently, the only one that's done missions under our shelves. When you have a vehicle that, that's that large, you have the ability to deliver larger sensor packages to the areas that we want to measure. But notice for gliders, we're talking about year-long endurance here. We're talking about hours or days for endurance of vehicles in this class right now. We do a lot of work with um, instruments you mount on the ice. So whereas the other instruments you're looking at either drift or swim in, in the water column, these instruments are mounted on the ice, uh, typically with an expression below the ice that allow them to sample the ocean below, the ice in between, and importantly, the atmosphere above and provide access to satellite services, right? Because now you have something that bridges that, that ice barrier. So you can bring data from the ocean up back to the atmosphere and then back to satellites. So one of the big issues here with working in a, an ice covered environment is that satellites, satellite services are blocked, right? The, the instruments operating within the water column can't access satellites any, any longer. So we typically rely on acoustics for navigation and communications, low frequency acoustics for nav, high frequency acoustics for for communications, the issue being that low frequency acoustics run over long ranges, hundreds of thousands of kilometers, whereas higher frequencies are very limited how far they can go, um, single kilometers typically. If you can run a, a fiber optic cable to the instrument, you can have very high bandwidth transfers back. And then there are techniques for free space optical transmission, uh, much lower rates, and you have to be much closer. But uh, but they offer a, another mode of gain data back and forth. We navigate acoustically typically, and we do that by multilaterating for beacons of various uh, various frequencies, which he illustrated here as 900 hertz system. Um, everybody carries an accurate clock. The beacons broadcast on a known schedule. So when a, an asset like a glider or a float receives the broadcast, they can calculate a range from the beacon. With multiple broadcasts, they can calculate a position, right? Just by, by drawing range circles around where you, uh, where the, uh, where the beacons were. Uh, early on, we had to set the, the beacons in places where we knew where they were and tell the assets where the beacons were. Uh, a more modern iteration of those actually transmits the location of the beacon on the signal, right? So now the beacons can be mobile. And this is an illustration that Lee drew uh, the concept of how we do this, or we're planning to do it and have done it in ice shelves. Um, trying to work on an ice shelf, you can moor the acoustic beacons 
in the open water outside of the shelf where it's fairly easy to put them. There's also the possibility of drilling through the shelf and suspending beacons through the ice deep within the cavity. Uh, that's currently being done uh, in collaboration with the Norwegian group at the Fimuli Shelf. But the system you'll see just has uh, just has beacons moored at the outside. We put all that together in experiments in, in the Arctic. Uh, the initial one was looking at the marginal ice zone. We expect that there's going to be a, a large transition in the kinds of physics that govern the, the evolution of sea ice in the marginal ice zone as we see increasing amounts of open water. So this experiment was aimed at, at looking at looking at that change in physics. The issue here was that we had to go from pack ice, which is very solid, you can put things on it, through the marginal ice zone, which is broken up and you can no longer actually put instruments on the ice itself into the open water where we can use all the techniques that we would typically use in, in an open water system. To do that, we uh, we designed a system that, that basically put a carpet of fairly lightweight instruments down, ranging from the open water through the marginal ice zone into the pack. We did this at a time when it was all packed, so we could do it with aircraft, land on the ice, deploy the instruments, um, and then let it melt out, kind of eating up the instruments through the open water area, but, but maintaining things into the pack. And the idea here was you would have instruments mounted on the ice, you'd have mobile instruments that would span the span the water column, right, going from open water into the pack ice. Um, and then instruments operate in the, the open water outside. And they yielded measurements like this. These are these are measure these are sections running across the uh, across the ice. So here this is open water in this this region and then, then ice cover where you see the black at the top during the melt out and the freeze up periods. Um, temperature and salinity in the top panels and, and temperature and chlorophyll fluorescence because fluorescence was interesting during the freeze up in the bottom panels. And we, you can see very distinctive signatures of warm water below. Um, I don't really have time to get into this, but that, that has an impact on uh, releasing stored heat into the ice and, and accelerating the, the melt. And during freeze up, you can see signatures of a, a fall bloom in subsurface chlorophyll maximums. But the interesting part here was this ability to really span the open water of the ice cover regions. I'm going to go quickly here because we're kind of running out of time. But um, next, what I'd like to concentrate on is, is work that was done at the Dotson Ice Shelf. And this was a uh, an effort to, to put floats and gliders into the cavity itself um, by mooring three sound sources outside the outside the ice shelf, inserting floats into the uh, into the warm inflow where they would be carried by the warm inflow and then transition to the cold outflow to be ejected from the shelf so they would follow this entire pathway through. And then run autonomous gliders, both across the, the face of the shelf and into the cavity. Now, in doing this, we didn't really know how far the, the acoustic signals would penetrate into the cavity. We had an idea that we can designify the entire cavity, but we didn't know for sure. That was, the, that was the way that the vehicles were going to navigate within the cavity, so we had to be a little cautious going into it. But the goal was to maintain these measurements over the course of an entire year. So through the ice-covered season, when go, go in when it was ice-free in front, continue to sample after the ice came in through the winter, and then, uh, then continue to sample through the, the following summer. I figured we'd get about a year of endurance. So and that is not playing, it looks like. Okay, well. There should have been a movie here, but it's not playing through the uh, through the share. But what you see, you, you'll see the tracks in a minute in the next slide. But the, the, these three triangles where the, the navigation warrants are put, um, we've got instruments at the range into the shelf, uh, three gliders and four floats. The gliders overwintered um, in front of the dot size shelf, the M apex floats were carried into the cavity and then ejected. Um, okay, so now what you should be seeing are the tracks of everything. It's a little less distinct, but I can walk you through what happened. Uh, we got here when the icebreaker on, the Korean icebreaker, deployed the three acoustic moorings. 
deployed the, the four, the three gliders with, and the four floats. The floats are deployed at this end, which is where, right in, in this area, which is where the, the warm inflow comes into the, the cavity. And those are the blue tracks that you see. They were carried deep into the cavity. Three of them came back out again. So they made this entire transit kind of following the warm waters that went in. That's important because part of the interesting question was how that warm water interacts with the uh, shelf itself. The gliders started by making small forays into the, uh, into the cavity. And then we got braver as time went on and went deeper. And eventually got to the point where we knew the entire cavity was asonified so that we could sort of move at will. So we were doing these latitudinal sections and these longitudinal sections across cavity. When winter came, because we didn't quite have enough time to perfect the uh, autonomous algorithms to inject the gliders into the shelf, um, to basically get under the uh, under the lip of the shelf, we held the gliders the, outside the shelf and did sections across. And then when summer came again, we restarted the explorations into the cavity. So all told, right, many, many latitudinal sections, a smaller number of longitudinal sections by the gliders, the four float drifts, um, longest transit was about 240 kilometers of observations inside the cavity, solid acoustics throughout the cavity, and uh, a lot of good lessons about how you run gliders in, in this environment. Uh, gliders are not like other AEVs where the navigation is a little more uncertain and you don't have any many, very many tools for telling where you're at when you see obstacles. So it's, it's um, you do a lot of the navigation by braille when you encounter obstacles, particularly the horizontal. This is an example of a, a glider section running into the cavity. So you can see it gets almost all the way back into the, uh, into the grounding line, temperature and salinity. Um, lots, of, lots of good patterns that you see in terms of how the, the warm water is getting up towards the, towards the ice shelf and a, a lot more structure to that than we had uh, necessarily expected to see. These are examples of the annual cycle in front of the shelf, um, the examples of, of sections of gliders we're taking. And the important part here, if you look at summer of 18, summer of 19, two sections taken around the same time of year, they're pretty different, right? And that's that's a good, a good cautionary tale of interpreting single sections or single measurements um, too intensely, right? There's a lot of an, annual variability, interannual variability, and and decon section section variability when we look at the uh, look at the observations. But one of the value of doing uh, an annual cycle of these and many sections from the shelf is you can start to form means. Right when we do that, we can actually see things like the warm water flowing in and the colder water flowing out. We can look at the changes in salinity, and we can resolve the uh, the geostrophical flows of the, the large scale flows going in and out of the, the shelf. We can also look at things like the standard deviations of temperature and salinity, which are really gross measures of, of variance in temperature and salinity, but they uh, they track the shelf base, which is interesting to us because it, it suggests that these lateral stirring mechanisms of bringing warm water into the uh, into the base of the shelf. So I'll end with three quick slides here, um, looking at what we're doing moving forward. These are measurements uh, taken over a year in the central Beaufort Sea. So now we're flipping back to the Arctic. But the point here is we've got a glider that we, we injected from outside the ice pack. We brought it into an area that was covered by the, the Cusick Navarre. And then we had it essentially loiter in this area for a year, making measurements in this, in this one spot and then come back out again. All right, so this was, this was interesting to us because it's an important area of the Beaufort Sea. We can see these eddies coming in, right? We can see these interesting lateral signatures. But it, technologically, was interesting because it was this ability to inject a, an instrument in from over the horizon, right? Come in, make measurements, go out again. We're working on different navigation systems. Uh, this is a 35 hertz navigation beacon. Most of what you saw before was done with the 900 hertz beacon, which has ranges of about 500 kilometers in the area where we have a sound channel more like 100 kilometers in areas where there is no sound channel. 35 foot speaking, give us um, basic transarctic ranges, right? We can insonify most of the Arctic with a small number of these beacons. 
We're also working on techniques for single beacon range and bearing, right, which allow a, a, a autonomous asset to tell where it is, roughly, um, from a, a single 35 hertz to 900 hertz beacon. So that work is actually ongoing as we speak. And there's a, we put beacons up there this, earlier this summer and have a ship going back right now to uh, get a closer look. And that's all part of the Sartic Mobile Reserving System effort. This is a, a ONR funded effort to, to develop a, a multi-platform system for establishing Arctic observing systems. Um, the idea is to have a, a nested set of systems Conceptually, you see this in the, in the lower right-hand corner here, where you have a, a central node, if you will, that acts as a hub, um, perhaps offering recharge for faster systems, autonomous, larger propeller-driven autonomous vehicles, um, more distributed arrays for navigation and, and sensing, sensing beacons, ladders or other autonomous systems running back and forth, painting a larger picture, and, uh, and drifting systems arrayed around this area. You can see this kind of in the cartoon version of these larger larger systems, right? Docking AUVs, gliders running in between the systems. Uh, we've gotten most of the system working at this point, or demonstrating various parts of it at this stage. And I will, uh, I'll stop there for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for this really interesting presentation. Uh, so, no, no, so question time. Sure. So we do have a few questions on the Mentimeter already for Craig. Um, one of the questions was, it was a bad one, sorry. Have you ever lost a glider in the cavities below the ice shelf? So, um, in general, we've lost a rather large number of them in the process of developing the, the ability to work under the ice. The ice shelf itself, we've only done that the one time we're still kind of developing proposals to go back and do another. The uh, there was never a solid plan for recovery of any of that hardware, right? It's difficult to get into those areas. We got arrived with our Korean colleagues for the deployment. We had a, a colleague from the UK who thought that she might be going back to that region the following year. So the deal was that if she, she went back, we would recover the gear. And if she didn't go back, everything would die out there. And indeed, she did not make it back to the Dotson the following year or so. So we got all of our data back, which is one of the nice things about autonomous platforms. But, uh, but all the vehicles ran the batteries out. Okay. So another question is, what new information could the gliders gather if they could go deeper? And what is the maximum depth below the ice shelves that you found? So the, to me, the, the most inter interesting part of this was, was closer to the surface, closer to the, the ice ocean boundary. Uh, the bathymetry was very different from what the bathymetry we had going in, which was inferred by gravity measurements and other techniques, it, it turns out that that bathymetry was, was horribly wrong. <laughs> For example, it, it, it indicated that there would be a, a large sill going into the shelf and there was no such sill. Um, so that, you know, that, that was interesting because the way we figured that out was by, by the fact that the vehicle didn't see the bottom for part of it or it saw the bottom and the bottom was not where it was supposed to be typically deeper than it was, was supposed to have been. Um, we might get a, a better picture of, of warm inflows if we could, could go deeper. But we have, we have a 6,000 meter variant of the vehicle that we potentially could have used here. And we're developing a, a 3,000 meter vehicle that would pretty much give us range over the entire domain for these kinds of problems, right? It would, less land on the bottom in the high shelf environments. They may at least you put in that. Okay, so you sort of kind of touched on this question, but I guess what is the dream instrument uh, mobility system combination that you don't yet have that you would love to have? 
<laughs> um, it, it's really a combination of things, right? There, none of these systems is is typically wonderful alone. So we use we use systems in tandem, uh, floats and gliders, high space instruments. But right now, we would love to be able to do single beacon navigation from a low frequency source. Right, that would free us up to to do a lot of different things. Uh, we're not there yet. The you know when I, I think about the kinds of problems that this group is focused on, um, you know the the navigation techniques you might need to rely on might not be the ones we're focused on version environments. Right there, there are techniques for for localization of a vehicle based on the terrain that it's it's in, where it basically goes out, maps its terrain, and continually extends that map and uses that as its as a navigation reference frame, as opposed to a, an acoustic system or something else. So it, it's those techniques aren't available to gliders. Right, the navigation is too uncertain and the, the power budget is too too limited. But you could imagine um, more sophisticated, more expensive vehicles that could do those those kinds of functions. Okay. And then there's a question here that's on science and it's very terrestrial. So it's like, do you see a strong variability of the measurements over a day? Like, is there a diurnal cycle that you're noticing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, not so far, although we haven't really stared at the data for that with that lens. I, if I had to guess, it would be that as you, you know, towards the front of the shelf, that you at the very least see a tidal cycle. All right, and in, in, in the physics and, and presumably that impact on a on the biology and biogeochemistry, but as, as you get Deeper, I'm not sure. It's a good question. Okay. And so we do have a question here for um, Alexis as well. And they wanted to know what kind of, and I guess this would work for Craig as well. It's like, what kind of precautions do you use to avoid contamination or forward contamination of your vehicle or um, device when you're sampling a unique site? And I'm going to guess I need to unmute Alexis. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we haven't gone far down those roads. We would have, um, we bring everything. I mean, we're trying to do sterile technique for almost all of the work that we do. So we bring everything sterilized and we try and re-sterilize it through the process, but we're not anywhere near a sort of level of contamination control that you would need in a mission design context. Um, and over time, the process of what we think we're sampling has changed and what we would need to be prepared to do. So if we were to go back in the field, both the instrumentation, the types of samples, everything would be different. We have to start from scratch and think through that important problem. Okay. And this is me, Mike, actually asking an early question is what <laughs> sort of, uh, of um, sterilization techniques do you guys use in the field prior to sampling? like ethanol wipe or peroxide or? Yeah, um, um, once we're in the field, almost everything is, is ethanol based. And a lot of times it has to be wipe based, like you just asked, because it's something we can keep packaged and use. Um, we, depending on like our ability to transport different chemicals, we've had things labeled as ethanol then confiscated um, in transit. And we don't know until we're about to go into the field. So it's been shipped up to, the, the base from which we're being delivered on Twin Otter or, or helicopter. And then we're like, oh my God, all the ethanol has been taken away. So um, being ready to do that. So bleach is also something that at least, um, interestingly, people remove from our luggage less often than ethanol. Okay. <laughs> I guess the UV light gets to stay. Yeah. <laughs> And then I guess transferring over to, to Craig, similar question. Do you have to do any type of sterilization or cleaning of your, um, I mean, I, I'm guessing fouling must be a major problem too, right? Or, or for long duration? Yeah, fouling can be a, 
an issue depending on where we're working. Um, the, the, the common wisdom is that fouling is the thing that will prevent a lot of these platforms from functioning for many years at a time. Certainly things that, that come near the surface in the photo zone. Um, we haven't seen a lot of it in, in Arctic environments. And really, really, we have very little experience in Antarctic or high shelf environments to, to know. I would say that the data that came back from the the three gliders that were working under the shelf didn't indicate fouling, and the way we would know would be a change in the drag in the vehicle. We can tell that by the change in slight characteristics hmm. from looking at the data. Um, and we didn't we didn't see that. I, yeah, it's interesting. You know, another one of these things from from coming from different communities, right? The the oceanographer community typically hasn't worried about forward contamination because environments we're we're moving into are continually flushed. We we worry about um, basically introducing toxic waste into the environment with things that we do, but not a. Uh, not typically something that rides in on the vehicle. Um, you know, ballast water contamination would be the the obvious analog, right? Mm -hmm. But the the vehicles that, that get deployed typically aren't. Uh, they're not carrying things with them when they go in because they haven't been out. They've been in the lab and cleaned. And but the level of the level of care that the Lexus you would take or they would talk about here isn't. Uh, isn't currently something that's considered, and, and you know, perhaps it should be for some of the some of the missions that go into to more remote or exotic regions. I guess a question I have is like for Alexis that you're seeing uh, something that is actually coming up onto the surface and expressing itself on the surface of the ice shelf. Is there any possibility the same type of process or a similar process could effectively create? A system where the sulfur flux would be presenting on the lower part of an ice shelf. So effectively, you'd be looking down at something, and Craig would be looking up at something. That, but it would be the same sort of sulfur-based phenomena. Uh oh, I have a feeling I might have locked. Did I lock? There you go. Yeah, I, I, Sorry I about that. Couldn't unmute. Well, um, I don't know if Alice and Murray still on the call, but you know, I think it's her paper with um, um, there's the cartoon in for Europa where it's a biofilm on the underside of the ice, and the idea there is that it's like a very reducing um, ocean on Europa, but there's some oxidants that are present. It's almost like sucking on a straw at one of these areas of communication. And so all of the biomass is localized right there. And so, yes, it'd be on the underside of the ice, but you'd be looking up at it if you were in the ocean doing exploration. So, yes, they're, depending on the distribution of essentially where that habitable environment gets placed by the physiochemical dynamics going on there, you could you could create that kind of scenario that you just mentioned. And it was sh shown in cartoon form um, in that conceptual paper for Europa. And with the instrument suites that you normally have on board your um, uh, vehicles, Craig, would you be able, how would you detect something like that at that scale? Uh, it's the, the scale that would worry me. Um, you know, the, the normal way you do it in the water column would be if you had a sensor, it could detect traces of what you're looking for. You, you know, you would run vehicles and try to run a search pattern and follow, follow gradients, right, to try to detect a, a point source like that. It's, um, it's an interesting problem, right, how you, if you land in a random place that you don't really know is going to have much, how you, how you do the, Go from the broad scale, broad scale search is something that you narrow in on to something that that's that's really sounds like it would be quite tiny. Yeah. Or really hard to find. 
Okay, so, so those are all that kind of wraps up the questions from the Mentimeter. And actually, a couple were kind of me ad libbing because I got really excited about all the, the both talks. So <laughs> thanks for indulging me. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Audrey, to finish this yeah. out. Thanks, Mike. So I think that we can close this episode. So thank you for your participation. And we hope to see you at the next episode, uh, which is planned in December and probably on laboratory studies. Thanks.